Is there anybody out there who's maybe just a little bit like me and you really feel like you don't need more complication in your life? Is there anyone who finds themselves struggling to keep a good attitude when simple things seem to become complicated? Anybody? You know what I'm talking about? You just said, I, I just want to grab a bite to eat. And then you get the menu and you can't even read it. And it's, it's complicated. You say, I, I just want to get a cup of coffee. And you step up and they say, do you want that half-calf, decaf, full-calf? Like, I, I don't want a calf. I don't want a lamb. I want a cup of coffee. Get a little complicated in our lives. And sometimes what we need is just simplicity. Sometimes what we need is just the simple truth of the gospel. About 500 years ago, a monk in Wittenberg, Germany, felt like the church was getting a little complicated. A lot of rules were being put out. A lot of options were being put in front of people. Ways that they could earn salvation and earn freedom from sin. And he said, you know, we need to simply turn to the Word of God. And so, almost 500 years ago, on October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther nailed what has come to be known as the 95 Thesis to the door of All Saints Church in Wittenberg, Germany. And in so doing, that act sparked what we now know as the Protestant Reformation. A reshaping of his church that we are the beneficiaries of today and an approach to church that we continue to walk in. I believe that the reshaping of his church is an ongoing process that God is continually calling his people to come back to the truth of his word. And so this month as we approach the 500th anniversary of this world-changing event, we look at some of the principles of the Protestant Reformation as they apply to our lives today. We've talked about Scripture alone having authority. By faith alone, we approach God and receive the free gift of salvation. And today we look at the third of five principles that we see in the Reformation movement, and that is by grace alone are we saved. I would encourage you to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2 as we look at one of the definitive passages of Scripture on the topic of grace. Would you stand to your feet for the reading of the Word of the Lord beginning at Ephesians 2 verse 7. In order that in the coming ages he might show his incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word, for the simplicity and the relevance of Scripture that speaks to our hearts and lives today as it did to those in the church in Ephesus 2,000 years ago. That calls us back to the foundation that you laid as you called back your followers 500 years ago to the biblical truth that it is by grace alone that we have eternal life. By your grace, may your truth not only penetrate our hearts and minds, but continue to reshape us, your church. 
In Christ Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. While our approach at Radiant Life Church is always biblically based teaching and preaching, this message series is inspired by the 95 thesis that Martin Luther nailed to the church door in Wittenberg, Germany. And many of those theses were very specific to the church and the time in which Martin Luther lived and worshipped. But I want to highlight each week some that I believe are very relevant to us even today. And so I simply draw your attention to a modern translation of the 95 Thesis Number 62, Martin Luther wrote, the main treasure of the church should be the gospels and the grace of God. The main treasure of the church. Number 63, indulgences make the most evil seem unjustly good. And 68, they, indulgences, are the furthest from the grace of God and the piety and love of the cross. You see, The principle of grace was one that had been glossed over. As the papacy in the 16th century was trying to make improvements to the physical structures of St. Peter's Basilica, in order to raise money, the Roman Catholic Church sold indulgences. Sold Pardons from sins that had not yet been confessed. Sins that may be forgotten. The sins of deceased loved ones to shorten their time in what Catholic theology describes as purgatory. And so Martin Luther, who desired to have a closer, more intimate relationship with God and a biblically rooted faith and practice of his faith, addressed the fact that all of the relics that were being sold to finance the church, splinters of wood that were said to have come from the very cross of Jesus, locks of hair that were said to have been plucked from his beard during the beating, objects stained with dark colored liquid that was said to have been the blood of Jesus. Things that were said to have been held and touched and owned and used by saints were said to have had great powers. And these objects and the indulgences that were being issued from Rome were becoming the focal point of the church rather than the true treasure of the church, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The grace of God by which we are saved. The grace of God is an incomparable grace. We read in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7, in order that in the coming ages he might show his incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. This word incomparable, meaning nothing can compare to it, comes from the Greek word uperbalo or hyperbalo, which literally means overthrowing. It's also translated as surpassing. And it's only used Five times in the New Testament, all five times, Uperbalo was penned by the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the churches at Corinth and Ephesus. This is where we get the English word hyperbole, Uperbalo. Hyperbole is an obvious exaggeration or extravagance. And I would submit to you today that the riches of God's grace are extravagant, exaggerated beyond simply extending a gift or favor. It's more than enough. 
We read in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning at verse 13, Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Folks, I want to encourage you today that, that my heart leaps for joy when I see God's people come together to serve the Lord. This weekend's been a, a wonderful time. I've had the opportunity to spend a few hours on Friday and Saturday working with our church board to expand our welcome center, double the size of our welcome center, so that at the conclusion of each service, as you bring guests with you every Sunday, you'll know that there is room for you to be able to come and introduce them to leaders in our church, to have questions answered, to make a connection because we're all about people. God's given us a tremendous treasure in the form of this 36,000 square foot facility at 75 North Crescent. But I got to tell you, this building is not the treasure of the church. The gospels and the grace of God, they are the treasure of the church. I want to encourage you today that as much as my heart is elevated when I see people painting doorways down the education wing hallway and hanging signs to make it easier for people to navigate our facility, when I see Richard Barth who every week volunteers his time, his talent, and his resources to mow our lawn and trim the bushes, my heart is encouraged by the acts of service and I give glory to God, but it's not simply for the work that's being done, but because of the surpassing grace that God has given to those who serve. Because we serve not out of interest for what's in it for us, but out of gratitude for the grace that God has given to us. Thanks be to God for His indescribable gift. It's incomparable grace. Nothing compares. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning at verse 9, we read of the Apostle Paul speaking about his conversation with his best friend, Jesus. And in prayer, as the Apostle Paul approached the very throne room of God, Jesus spoke to his heart. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, we read, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Friends, I have to tell you, if you haven't received the grace of God, this passage of Scripture makes no sense. But if you have received the grace of God, then you can say a hearty amen to the fact that when we are weak, then we are strong because of His grace at work within us. His grace is sufficient for us. Now this isn't the word hyperbolo or incomparable, surpassing grace. No, this is archaeo in the Greek. A grace that possesses unfailing strength. A grace that is satisfactory. So when we read, my grace is sufficient for you, Jesus said, to one that he loved. What he's truly saying is, my grace comes with unfailing strength. My grace satisfies. 
Many times we think of sufficient a- 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 as something almost dismissive. I mean, if your child comes home with their report card and they say, look, I, I, got, I got four A's and two B's. Or today, I got three ones and six fours. And you have no idea what that grading system is. Your kid comes home, they show you this report card, and you start reading the teacher's notes to try and make sense of what it really means. They look at you, desiring for approval. They say, well, what do you think? How'd I do? And you look at your child and you say, well, you did sufficient. How many of you think your kids are going to jump for joy? But if you say... You know what you showed? You showed unfailing strength. What? You know what? As your dad, as your mom, I want you to know I'm so satisfied with you. I'm so happy with you. You fill my heart with joy. When I look at your report card, it just reflects what I've always known to be true about you. And that is, you're a chip off the old block. (laughs) Now what I've known to be true about you is that you're really great. See, God's sufficient grace says to you and to me, I have everything you need. And when I give it to you, You will want nothing more. That's his incomparable grace. There's nothing in this world that compares. His incomparable grace is also a humbling grace. We read in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. We we live in a culture that likes to talk about taking pride in our work, taking pride in ourselves. And I have yet to find a passage of Scripture that uses that kind of language. But what I do find throughout Scripture is that God humbles the proud. And he exalts the humble. You see, when we receive the grace of God, if we begin to think that we somehow deserved it, that we somehow earned it, that it somehow was about us, we miss the whole point. And I believe that God has the ability to turn the faucet off and say, Sounds like you've soaked up enough of my grace for right now. You're pretty full of yourself. But when you and I recognize the fact that we receive his grace not because of our own good works, not because of our own good deeds, not because of our popularity or how good we look, but we receive his grace simply because of him. In fact, I'm going to take it a step further. We don't even receive his grace because of our faith. We receive his grace through our faith. Our faith, therefore, becomes the conduit through which his grace flows in our lives and out from us. And as long as we humbly receive his grace, he'll keep the faucet flowing so that his grace will flow through us. He's always looking for humble servants. The word grace in Ephesians chapter 2 is charis. It's found 156 times in the New Testament, and 130 of those times, charis is translated as grace. Half a dozen times it's translated as favor, and almost a dozen times it's some form of gratitude or thanks. Charis, it's the root of charisma, which 
is the spiritual gifts that we receive through the Holy Spirit. Charisma is also the free gift of salvation. Charis. The grace of God that's freely given that we don't deserve. It's humbling to think about the fact that God would just give us all that we need. Sufficient grace, incomparable grace. Remember that this is also rooted in the word Cairo, which means to rejoice. Behind the gifts of the Spirit, behind the free gift of salvation, behind the grace of God at work in our daily life, in our acts of thanksgiving, we rejoice. We rejoice in the Lord. And I have to tell you, we don't rejoice pridefully in our own accomplishments, but rather in God's lavishing His goodness upon us. The Old Testament prophet Jeremiah offers a beautiful illustration of our dependence on God's grace with a humbling indictment of our need for God's grace because of our own depravity. Look with me to Jeremiah 17, beginning at verse 7, we read, But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in Him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes, its leaves are always green. It has no worries in the year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Now this is an interesting passage of scripture. Many of you have probably read verse 9 before. Let me just ask, does that sound familiar to anybody? The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Many of you have probably read, blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confident is in Him. Maybe you've even sang the words like a tree planted by the water. I shall not be moved. Anybody ever sang that song before? It all sounds familiar. But do you realize it's one flowing passage that the Holy Spirit inspired? Blessed is the one who trusts in Him. Who is that one? The one who trusts in him is the one who stops trusting in themselves. The one who trusts in him recognizes, I can't do it without him. Oh, blessed is that one. They're like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. Oh, the one who trusts in him, they don't fear when the heat comes. Their leaves are always green. Yeah, the one who trusts in him, oh, that one has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. The one who trusts in him is capable of enduring pain and hardship and waiting for God to deliver on his promises. The one who trusts in him sees God's promises fulfilled for God's glory. Amen. But the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Lest the one who trusts in him becomes self-reliant and thinks that all that fruit, all those green leaves somehow had something to do with themselves. See, the heart is easily deceived by the father of all lies. who tells us you don't really need God, just as he told the first woman in the garden. If you eat from that tree, you'll be like God. And her husband said, that sounds good to me. And Adam and Eve invited sin into the world by their own choice to allow their deceitful hearts to distract them from God's grace. Friends, I don't want you to get down 
by the fact that we need God's grace. I believe God wants to lift us up, and that's why he gives us his grace. In 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning at verse 5, we read, In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. And all God's people said, "Uh uh-huh. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. He cares for you. So you can come to him in your brokenness. You can come to him in your anxiousness. You can come to him just as you are because he cares for you. In this passage of Scripture, you'll notice There's a phrase in quotation marks. That's a reference to Proverbs 3.34. God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. The word here for favor in the Greek is charis. It's grace. It's the same word that's translated as grace in Ephesians chapter 2. Charis. God shows grace to the humble. And if we humble ourselves before God's mighty hand, He will lift us up in due time. Amen? Amen. Friends, I want to encourage you. God doesn't show us his grace to pump up our pride. No, he shows grace to the humble to empower us to glorify and honor him. His grace. His grace is not only incomparable grace. His grace is not only humbling grace, but his grace is is empowering grace. I believe that's good news to you and me. We read in Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. There are many who struggle to reconcile grace and works. Many grab a hold of works-based theology and ignore grace. Many bask in grace and forget the very reason that God's word says he gives grace. Which is that we might do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Let's unpack that just a little bit. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9 beginning at verse 6, we read, remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. I want to make sure you understand the context of this passage of Scripture. How many of you know context is important? Helps us understand what God's saying, what he was saying to those first readers, what he is saying to us today. The context of this passage of Scripture has specifically to do with financial giving. I have good news for you, friends. If you've ever heard this passage quoted just before an offering to help motivate you to give joyfully, I want to prepare you for what's coming up in this service. Not an offering. I'm not here to manipulate you with the word of God. But rather, intentionally, we're reading this passage of Scripture after we've collected the offering so that the Word of God can marinate in our hearts and not just motivate us in the moment, but transform us throughout the course of our lifetimes. You get where I'm going with this? I want to encourage you today. If you've ever heard it preached that whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously... And that that passage of Scripture suggests that the more you give, the more you'll get. I want to tell you in the name of Jesus that is my firm belief that that's hogwash. That's a theological term for those of you who don't understand it. Hogwash. 
God's not saying to you and me, give more to the church and I'll give more to you. He's saying that your giving is a reflection of the condition of your heart. And if you have turned off the faucet, then you can expect a heart that dries up. But if you are generous in your giving and trusting in the Lord humbly, then you can rest assured that God will continue to provide for every need and you'll have nothing to worry about. That's what I believe this passage of Scripture is saying to you and to me. So does that mean that we should generously give to the work of the Lord through our local church? Absolutely it does. Absolutely. What did you think I was going to say? You thought I was going to say hogwash again? Uh Uh-uh. Not letting you off that easy. Uh Uh-uh. Absolutely we should give generously. But we should each give what we have decided in our hearts to give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion because God loves a cheerful giver. If you can't give cheerfully, don't give at all. I mean it. If you're giving with a grudge, the grudge that you have is only going to be worsened by your giving. If there is already a wedge in your trust with God, everything you give is going to drive that wedge in deeper And you are going to voluntarily separate yourself further and further from God rather than pulling the wedge out of the way and allowing the floodgates to open in your life. Give joyfully. I know some people have said, if you can't give joyfully, give anyway. I'm not saying that to you today. Because I believe at the heart of giving, the root of charis, is Cairo, is joy. And I believe that God's grace is given to us that we might abound in joy. That's why he loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless. Charis, that's grace. God is able to bless or extend grace to you abundantly. He's able to give to you what you don't deserve. He's able to give to you more than enough so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you may abound in every good work. Now this is interesting because I think sometimes we get things out of order. And we think if I do the right things, then I'm going to get what I want from God. If I have enough faith, then God will extend his grace to me. If I do enough good works, then God will extend his grace to me. I'm going to use that theological word again. Hogwash. That's stinking thinking, friends. Because I have received his grace, I am now, therefore, empowered to accomplish his will, to partner with him in doing good works. If you wonder whether or not you are a recipient of the grace of God and you are saved, I would submit to you that the evidence is in the fruit. Are you like a tree planted near streams of water, trusting in God to provide bearing good fruit? The fruit of the Spirit. I pray with my children every night that the fruit of the Spirit will abound in our family. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Against such things, the Word of God tells us, there is no law. I want to encourage you today. God did not extend His grace. He doesn't give salvation, and He doesn't give the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the charisma, He doesn't give gifts like tongues charismata so that we will become prideful. He doesn't give them so that we will become comfortable. He doesn't give them so that we will become complacent. He gives the gifts of the Spirit so that we will be His hands and feet extended, reflecting 
His glory and His goodness. God gives grace so that we might partner with Him. And through His power, do the good works He's called us to do. Show me a Christian who does not do good works and I will show you a Christian in name only. It's awfully quiet in here. I'll move on. God requires nothing of us in order to receive salvation. However, he does have certain expectations of those who have accepted his free gift, his grace. Genesis to Revelation, the story is continual. The truth of God is the same yesterday, today, and forever through the person of Jesus Christ. And I believe that in Jesus Christ we have the fulfillment of Old Testament law. In Jesus Christ we have the fulfillment, not the abolishment. So the words of the Old Testament still speak truth into our lives today. The Old Testament minor prophet Micah answers the question, what does God want us to do? What does God expect of us? In Micah chapter 6, verse 8, we read, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. I, I think this is a simple, straightforward description of the very good works that God prepared in advance for you and me to do. To act justly. To be fair in our dealings with other people. Not to swindle people. Not to elevate our needs above the needs of others, but to act justly. To love mercy. Not to only give people what they deserve, but to give them more than they deserve. Why? Because we are the recipients of His grace and His mercy. We've already received more than we deserve. And in response to that, what does the Lord require you and me who have already received Christ Jesus to do? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. The implication here is to remain in a state of humility. How many of you remember the turning point in your life when you made a decision to follow Jesus, when you began to identify yourself as a follower of Jesus. Do you remember that day? Many of us do. I have to confess to you that I can remember turning back to God a number of times. I was very young when I first made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. My children are very young. I remind them what that day was like. I was there with them. For them, it was nearly at the beginning of time. For me, it wasn't that long ago. But God desires for you and me to remain in a state of humility. He empowers us to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with him. You see that dependence right there? The words of the minor prophet Micah are true for you and me today. As are the words of Hebrews chapter 4 beginning at verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Hebrews 4.16 continues, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Radiant Life Church, I want to encourage you that you and I can approach the throne of grace with humble confidence, not prideful confidence. We can approach the throne of grace not confident in how ready we are 
not confident in how good we are, not confident in how faithful we are, not confident in how prepared we may be, but know we can approach the throne of grace humbly in confidence that He will deliver on every promise He has made, that we may receive His mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I don't know about you, but I need Him all the time. I need Him all the time. Today I wonder if you've bought into the lies of the enemy that somehow your best days were behind you. That the good works God had prepared in advance for you to do are now in the rear view mirror. That you've done your part. You've paid your price. I want to tell you, nothing you do is enough. It never will be. But he did enough. Our high priest, who knew the temptation that we now know, yet never sinned, he paid the price for you and for me to extend his grace. And I believe with everything in me, Radiant Life Church, that he did it because of his great love for us. He extended his grace and his grace alone saves us. His grace alone is incomparable. His grace alone humbles us without leaving us worthless and his grace alone empowers us through the Holy Spirit to accomplish the good works which he prepared in advance for us to do. I'm so grateful for the many who have committed themselves to caring for those in need in our community by offering prayers and bags of groceries through our food pantry. I'm so grateful for the many who participate in life groups in our church to share the needs of those that are part of our church family, to bear one another's burdens, to lift them up. I'm so grateful for the many who serve today and have served in our church leadership so that we can continue to move forward and accomplish God's will in this community. I'm so grateful for the many who do a myriad of things that go unthanked, who climb up onto the roof to repair tiles, who pull out screwdrivers to hang signs, who wield paintbrushes and rollers, lawnmowers. For those who physically find it challenging to complete those tasks, who will simply buy donuts or muffins, and show up with encouraging words for those who are laboring physically. But they participate nonetheless and partner together because at Radiant Life Church, we are committed to sharing life's journey through growing relationship with Jesus Christ. This, my friends, is a shared journey of grace.